Hey guys, welcome to my video on endocrine emergencies part one. This is ultra high yield case review for the USMLE step three. I'm going to start off by encouraging you to please subscribe and turn the notifications on. So in general and an acute medicine case, um, I look at it and approach it by first crafting a differential. And I do that by looking at three things the gender of the patient, the history of the disease, and the drugs or the medication um, taken, especially in psychiatric and endocrine diseases. Because with those medications, you oftentimes have iatrogenic side effects. And third, of course, the given clinical findings in the vignette, the deficits, etc. Finally, when you have your differential, use it to order all tests needed to address the possibilities, but don't look back once you've gotten your differential because what happens is you look back, you get trapped into distractors, and you second guess um, the thought process that may have most likely was correct in the first place. So in the vignette I'm going to go over today, we have a lethargic patient who is nauseous and has vomited. The patient is thirsty and smells of urine and alcohol and is slightly febrile. So other than a febrile temperature, the vitals are close to normal. And this is not always true in altered mental status cases, but in this case I'm saying that the vitals other than temperature are close to normal. So when you craft a differential for this kind of case, and this is called an altered mental status case with or without a urinary tract aberration, you want to determine uh, whether any of these differentials are present. So the first differential is the most obvious one. It's drug intoxication or overdose. The second one is CNS infection or inflammation. Notice that I have not listed infarction, and that's because there were no focal neurological deficits. Gastrointestinal infection, OBGYN, can cause altered mental status via sepsis. And endocrine emergency. So an endocrine emergency, examples of endocrine emergencies are myxedema coma, thyrotoxicosis, and of course, diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmol or hyperglycemic state can be precipitated by any of the above four differentials that I listed. So in terms of order, so this is quite a busy slide, but I'm going to go over just a few of these in detail. Uh, the toxicology screen is used to screen for commonly uh, over drugs that are commonly used to overdose like heroin like alcohol but the EKG the EKG is a, necess a necessity for every acute medicine case however in the case of altered mental status that we have it has many utilities. The first one is that you can determine whether or not there's an arrhythmia when the patient is brought in. Secondly, um, when you have altered mental status, you oftentimes have electrolyte abnormalities associated with that. So you look, you're able to look at the QT interval and T waves and see if hyperkalemia or aberrant calcium, like hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, as well as indirect uh, causes of electrolyte abnormality, such as digoxin toxicity, are actually affecting the myocardium. Secondly, when you look at the ST segment, you're looking for an elevation in terms of myocardial infarction. Because in, say for example, a diabetic emergency, the patient may have had or may be having a heart attack, but not realize it because they have autonomic neuropathy. So it's very, very useful for this reason. The TSH, the comprehensive metabolic panel, and the plasma glucose, as well as the urine, glucose, and ketones are used to help guide you 
into what kind of endocrinologic emergency you may have if you do have one. The BUN and creatinine are used to assess kidney function and kidney function can be affected in a HOHG because there's intravascular volume depletion which causes acute kidney injury. The rest of these, lights and ABG, super important to determine metabolic state, whether you have a metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. And the rest of these are just common sense. One thing is if there are no focal neurologic deficits, you don't need to do a CT scan before getting the lumbar puncture. This video will cover the case where you have a tox screen that's negative for everything except alcohol, and you also have hyperglycemia in the lab results. So hyperglycemia would be any non-fasting test of at least 126 milligrams per deciliter. So if you have hyperglycemia and you have elevated plasma osmolality, so that's above 320 milligrams per deciliter, the diagnosis is HOHG. Now, it has been documented that patients with HOHG tend to have really high random blood glucose, like above 600 milligrams per deciliter. However, even if you have a patient who has 500 milligrams per deciliter blood glucose and they have the elevated plasma osmolality, the diagnosis is HOHG. So in HOHG, the patient may be slightly acidotic, but the pH is still going to be close to normal and there's not going to be an anion gap. The elevated osmolality causes intravascular volume depletion, and I'm going to get more into that uh, later in this video. Now, if you have hyperglycemia plus anion gap metabolic acidosis, the diagnosis is diabetic ketoacidosis. And just to round out this slide, I'm going to go back to the point that I uh, made in the beginning of this video that once you make your differential, don't go back to the vignette. So we have um, kind of stereotypes of the different types of diabetes or different metabolic or endocrine diseases where type 2 is associated with obesity. So say you have a patient in the vignette, their weight is close to normal. You don't want to make your differential based on that. You want to follow your differential and analyze the lab results according to what is defined and necessary for each diagnosis. Calculations you need to know. So first is the anion gap. So what an anion gap is, is the concentration of the cations minus the concentration of the anions. Now we don't use in medical practice or for practical calculations, we do not use the concentration of potassium. Even though it's a cation, we do not use it and that's because it's such so minuscule it doesn't affect a calculation one way or the other. So we find the anion gap by taking the concentration of sodium and subtracting a combination of bicarbonate and chloride from it. And bicarbonate and chloride are of course the anion, the negatively charged ions or electrolytes. The anion gap is normally 6 to 12 milliequivalents per mole. So if you have an anion gap that is above 12 milliequivalents per mole, that is a high anion gap. The second important calculation is correcting for serum sodium in severe hyperglycemia. So what happens in severe hyperglycemia is water is pushed into the extracellular space. So the, on the blood lab report, it appears that the sodium concentration is very low, but you have to correct for the hyperglycemia. And it is said that for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose above normal, the sodium measured in the serum decreases by 1.6 milliequivalents per liter. So I'm going to give the, cap the formula. So what you do is you make X as your blood glucose. 
and you subtract 126 from it. So 126 is the norm, the high end of normal blood glucose. You divide that by 100 and you multiply that by 1.6. The number that you get from this calculation should be added to the sodium concentration that you're given. And that's how you correct. A pitfall could be if you see altered mental state plus hyponatremia, you see a low sodium serum sodium value in the lab values of, of a vignette. And you think it's SIADH. But SIADH patients would not have hyperglycemia. So if you see hyperglycemia, you always want to correct the sodium, serum sodium concentration. Another thing of note is SIADH patients would have decreased plasma osmolality. In diabetes, you have increased plasma osmolality. Potassium is peculiar because when you have a hyperglycemic lethargic patient, he's going to be hypokalemic. However, it, it's possible that the lab report will suggest otherwise. So how, how, why does this happen? Well, in every type of diabetic emergency that causes an altered mental state, you're going to have volume depletion of all electrolytes because there's diuresis, there, they have polydipsia. In the case of diabetic ketoacidosis, the keto acids push potassium out of the cells. So that causes perhaps a hyperkalemia on the blood report. In any case, you add potassium chloride to IV fluids. And of course, you continually monitor levels. So what if you only have hyperglycemia? So what if you only have hyperglycemia and you don't have uh, any metabolic acidosis and you don't have a, an elevated plasma osmolality? Well, the diagnosis is likely diabetic, sorry, the diagnosis is likely alcoholic ketoacidosis given the history. And the pathophysiology is similar to diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, in the case of alcoholic ketoacidosis, starvation is combined with the effects of alcohol in a patient who is intoxicated. So what happens is there is a lack of regulation of glucagon and hepatic gluconeogenesis kind of is increased. And so that's what produces the ketoacids. You have a, quite a substantial phosphorus and magnesium depletion in alcoholic ketoacidosis. So again, reiterating my point. So you've reached the end of my video. This series will be a mainstay of my channel, so new parts will be uploaded frequently along with um, me continuing to upload the other kinds of videos like my brainstem video, which will be uploaded soon. So please support me by subscribing, turn on the notifications, and thank you so much for watching.